Hey everyone, I'm Rather and Goherent. Today I'm going to quickly do a scenario tier list update for all of the things I played on the channel. I've obviously got opinions on the things I haven't played on the channel, but I'm a lot more critical when I'm playing on the channel because I get to go back and watch myself play. I played them off the channel, I've got a lot of thoughts to sort out, and I'm able to feel like I give a much better opinion. And then when I sit down to do this and I have to explain myself out loud, I feel like I give better rankings than I just like throw them on a tier list myself in my free time. So I have already rated these scenarios and I brought them down in the order they were rated, as in best on the left, worst on the right. I will be going through them in the order that the campaign wants you to play them in. By which I mean the order they're in in the book, the order you see them on the board in Tabletop Simulator. So we're going to be starting with Riddles and Rain, which I think is a great introduction. I think of it on roughly the same level as I think of Pit of Despair, though I think Pit of Despair is a better introduction to mechanics there. Because while Riddles and Rain is good and interesting and a great introduction to its things, I don't feel like it's as challenging or engaging as Pit of Despair is. Maybe I've just in three playthroughs never got it unlucky, I don't know. Maybe if you have bad RNG with the conceal mechanic, it can be way harder than I think it is. But I think the lack of difficulty and lack of engagement for me brings it all the way down to the top of good. I don't think it deserves to be quite in the same place as Pit of Despair. Next up in the order, you would be seeing Dead Heat. Marrakesh is one of my favorite scenarios in the set. It's a very tempo focused scenario. In my run, I intentionally sort of cheese the scenario. Before I summon the boss, I got enough clues to rescue like four people. Only two people died. I was like, technically saved twice as many. We're out. I was actually originally considering resigning if it didn't look like I could win. I was aware that if I resigned, all the people who hadn't been rescued are not instantly killed. So if you resign at four to two, then you get four experience. Obviously, that's worse. You don't get the key. You would like to kill Amaranth. But I was aware of that possibility going in and planning for it originally before I saw that Zoe more or less had it covered. Things got sketchy, though. There's a whole lot of damage. There are the original Grasping Hands in this set, in addition to a bunch of enemies that hit for physical kill damage and a variant Grasping Hands. It deals a shitload of damage. And going into that with double physical trauma on Zoe and five health on Charlie was not very safe. It got very sketchy towards the end. If you show up later, late enough, you auto fail, which I like thematically. I would hate that on a blind playthrough. But if you show up later, I think it's like days 18 to 24 or something like that. Then the boss actually spawns in play and so many civilians start dead that you're just hoping to get more saved than killed. You're never getting four experience. I like the crazy tempo pressure of just like you show up and the boss is just there and so many people are already dead and there is no act one. I like that version of the scenario, even though I understand that other people might hate it for the same reasons that I like it. The version of Dead Heat we saw, I don't necessarily think is the best version of Dead Heat, but I do think it's a very, very good scenario. I agree with Midnight Mass being my gatekeeper into A+, and I'm not sure if I think Dead Heat gets to be better than Midnight Mass. Because it is a very simple scenario. The second half is kind of boring for a Kluber if you just have to like save six people and that's just two turns of nothing but move actions and save actions. I think just barely because of that bad ending for Klubers and the fact that there are some teams that just literally cannot handle showing up late and having to deal with the boss. I think that's just enough to keep it out of the great tier in my eyes. Now, normally when I rank a scenario, I rank it on the best possible version. But for Sanguine Shadows, I've literally in three playthroughs never seen the secret final act. So I'm ranking it on the version that you're actually going to see in most of your playthroughs. Because aside from going out of your way with top tier characters to try to set up that final act, I don't think it's going to happen naturally in very many playthroughs. So even if I had gotten to it at this point, I think I'd want to rank it based on the normal version you see. I do think it's a very good or good scenario. It does a really good job for me of getting that feeling of chasing down a thief that's very clever. The representation of when you try to find her and you find a decoy, you get hit by her. Essentially being that she's left traps for you. So when you go down these dead ends and find the decoys, like you're getting some sort of home alone style bomb. And as a result, you're getting hit for that one one. I like that really thematically. It really works for me as a combination of flavor, theme and mechanics where I feel like it's correctly conveying everything perfectly. I hate how low Lair of Dagon and Into the Maelstrom are. Like, that's where they should be. I just hate that's where they should be. Because these scenarios are great. Like, they're well designed. They're just too damn easy because Innsmouth gives you too much experience. If these were actually hard and engaging and the tidal tunnels weren't used constantly throughout the rest of the campaign, these would easily have climbed to, like, the top of A+. It's just a shame to see them this low. Anyway, with Sanguine Shadows, I think living around a light in the fog and riddles and rain is a pretty appropriate place. 
I'm gonna go ahead and let a light in the fog stay above it. Next up, we have dealings in the dark. We're bringing that right to the top. Let's figure out where in the S tier this goes, because I love this scenario. I love the opening time pressure, where depending on how long you take, the Colts already made progress. For every player, there's a cultist working against you. The cultists are getting clues instead of doom, and it's just a competing investigation. If you fail, bad things happen, but you keep playing, you just fail forwards. There's no hard end, you just keep going to the next part. The first time setup is a mess, I know, but I'm not ranking them based on problems that you don't have on second playthroughs. You have that first part where it's just the investigation, then you go to the bazaar, you keep investigating, you find a thing, then you race back to the Galata docks. It's a lot of fun. I like each different part of the scenario. I think there are multiple points of pressure. Initially, you have just competing with the cult, then there are the boss enemies in the deck that you have to worry about. Then everything changes. They're all hunters. They're trying to take the key to you. It's a race. I love this. I think it's very comparable towards and too deep in my mind. I don't know why. I guess the flavor of it. They're both chase scenes, right? Is that why? Maybe. Chase scenes with a lot of threatening enemies at some point with a real risk of failure. I guess that's why I feel the comparison between them. I like it more than Blood on the Altar and I like it more than Unspeakable Oath. That might seem like heresy to a lot of people, but the fact that I have Blood on the Altar this high up means that I like it a lot more than most people. I am rating it on the Obanian Thug version, where you show up and it's just like cultists, birds, gangsters, everything's going to shit. You're like running for your life from the cultists and the gangsters and the birds. It's a madhouse. I love that version of the scenario. And I'm sorry, but I've never played a version of Unspeakable Oath where I had that experience other people have that seems so cool. Like, I still like it as a scenario, but I've never seen the pile up of enemies to make you have a real risk of dying. I've never really felt stressed about it. And I think as a consequence, that's why Unspeakable Oath is closer to the bottom of last year than the top. And I do think Dealings in the Dark, shit, does it get to live above Devil Reef? It definitely doesn't beat The Last King. No, Devil Reef is just too cool. I'm going to leave Dealings in the Dark right here, middle of my S tier. Dancing Mad, I haven't actually played on the channel. There are two versions of Dancing Mad, one where you get ambushed and you need to interrogate the cultist, and then one where you work alongside Desi, you don't get ambushed, and you just do a normal investigation. I think the ambush variant's way better. There's this wonderful thing where instead of starting in the whole map, you start in just one cafe where you get ambushed. All the concealed cards are piled with you. And then once you sort out the ambush, you put the rest of the map down, all the concealed cards scatter across the map, and then you have to chase them down and talk to them and try to figure out what's going on and put clues on them and do the investigation. And it has this wonderful feeling, again, of conveying flavor and thematics very well mechanically. That These guys jumped you, it went south, they ran away, now you're trying to chase them down and figure out what's going on. And then once you figure out what's going on, there's two Desis and they're pointing at each other like Spider-Man memes. I really love that version of the scenario. Just like Blood on the Altar, I'm gonna be ranking this higher because of that version of the scenario, I'm just looking at that one and not the weaker version. I honestly like it more than Midnight Mass. And I like it more than Shattered Aeons. I love that point you have during the scenario where you're like, wait a second, don't kill that guy, don't kill that guy. We need to interrogate him. We have got we got clues on him. We already shook down Desi for everything he knows. We need to talk to somebody else. Because you realize at some point, oh shit. Desi literally can't hold enough clues to finish the investigation. We need to shake down some random gangster for more information. And I think that moment is actually what pushes it above Midnight Mask and into my A-plus tier. On Thin Ice is a scenario that I've just been aggressively, it's somewhere between good and fine about. My strongest opinions about On Thin Ice are that I think the bear is a wonderfully designed card that is exactly what a bear should be, and that I don't know why two locations are connected. It's a scenario where if you show up too late, your total doom clock, is, I think it's 765, something like that. Anyway, you start with six doom on that first agenda. So you go down from 18 doom threshold for the whole scenario to um, 12. You just lose a third of the scenario. And it's balanced like that. If you show up early, you have all the time in the world. I showed up late, I still won with two whole turns left. It's not a hard scenario, the locations aren't hard. The bears are what bears should be, and that is to say that pulp action heroes can easily handle a bear. You can trip a bear and break its ankles and not deal with it. You can just shoot the bear. There's a million solutions to bears. You're playing Indiana Jones. You're not going to have a problem with animals. If you go against Thorn, I'm told that it's incredibly hard. And I can easily believe that because Thorn gives you more freedom in the final act to be a little more laissez-faire with your scouting tokens. And then you don't have to deal with getting ambushed by Thorn and fighting him and his goons. But like, provided that you ally with Thorn, which is the only version of the scenario I've seen, unfortunately, in my three playthroughs, it's just like a really easy scenario 
that doesn't incite any strong emotional response from me. And that's how you get to live at the top of Fine, I think. I think it's more well-made than every other scenario in Fine. Extracurricular activities doesn't get to love up here. Vanishing of Alina Harper does. I'm being mean to Vanishing for no reason. I know why I'm being mean to Vanishing, but it's not as bad as I'm ranking it. But extracurricular activities is not a fine scenario. It's, it's too boring, nothing matters. The things that are hard feel like they're way too hard, and things that are easy feel like they're too easy. I honestly feel like... God, it's a bad place to say something, Liz, but I think Om Ice gets to live as the gatekeeper to being a good scenario. It's the other side of Essex County Express. Yeah, I can't be so unopinionated about something and call it good, even though I feel bad calling it fine. Next up, we have Dogs of War. There are three versions of the scenario. The one I haven't seen, I believe, is Reverse Tower Defense, where the Beast has already stolen the Light of Pharaohs, and you have to get it back from him. Version 1 is Tower Defense, where you're working for the Claret Knight. And version 2, the Claret Knight's trying to play Tower Defense against you, and you're trying to steal the Light of Pharaohs from him, like the Beast is in version 1. I think Tower Defense is definitely the more interesting version of the scenario, but on my second playthrough with Charlie Kane and Zoe, when I was like more familiar with the scenario, I felt like I had so much time to just like set up and get rid of the Doom, and the Beast came out, and we just bullied the shit out of him for a couple of turns, got his victory location, and then left and won. I feel like once you have meta knowledge and you're playing remotely good characters, it's just a little bit too easy, and on my tier list, that always brings them down. I want to be engaged, and if something is too easy, I'm not. If I'm crushing every location and I'm flipping axe way faster than agendas and the enemies aren't scaring me, I just check out a little bit and it falls down the tier list ever so slightly. So I definitely think that it's probably going to live somewhere in good. I like it thematically so much and the beast is the right kind of unkillable enemy. I'm going to put it in very good. I think if it were a harder, more engaging, more tightly tuned scenario, it would be living very high up and very good. But as it is, I think it actually gets to live at the bottom of very good. I do really like Dogs of War. Next up, we have Shades of Suffering. Now, previously, this tier was named Awful. Now it's named Don't, because you don't play these scenarios. Undimensioned Unseen, show up and resign. Call and poor. Just don't unlock it. Don't go there. Don't spend the three days, the six days, however much extra time it takes you to go to this scenario. It's an optional challenge mode scenario that's overtuned and overly randomized. And sure, if you have the best characters in the game and meta knowledge, you can show up and get more victory than most other locations would give you. But you could have just gone and won the campaign. Like if you beat Shades of Suffering and didn't feel like you were risking traumas for no reason, then congratulations. You could have won the campaign just now. You could have just went to Congress of the Keys and finished the campaign. There is actually not a reason to play Shades of Suffering. And my opinions on Shades of Suffering would be different if it were fun. You can be overtuned and overly random, but a gang of strong top tier characters could still have a great time playing it. However, because literally half the deck is various forms of you have less actions in a tempo oriented scenario, so you just get told not to play your turn correctly all the time, just roll for compulsion. Up, oh, skipping two of my three actions. Oh, what's that? I only had one because everyone lost an action? Okay, maybe next time. And then the next turn comes around, you draw a surge into surge into something else, but those surge cards both said shift the key, and the key makes everyone lose an action. So congratulations, y'all get one action this round. Make it count. Like, Shades of Suffering is just not a fun scenario. Combine that with all its other problems, and you just don't go to Shades of Suffering. Without a trace, I have a lot of problems with, but unlike Shades of Suffering, if you go to Without a Trace, it makes the hardest part of the finale, which is the single most likely place for your campaign to end, into a cakewalk. And while that is making Congress of the Keys a less interesting, less good scenario, it sure as hell gives you a compelling reason to play Without a Trace. Now, I do have to mention, I'm ranking these on Meta Knowledge, second playthroughs, best versions. Without a Trace has the worst blind experience in all of Arkham. There is nothing worse. Don't play this scenario blind. That's the tier it's in. Ask for spoilers and then play without a trace. If you have already played them, you know why I feel this way. But if you haven't, you're clearly okay with the spoiler, so I'll tell you. Without a trace has the highest chance of permanently killing a character for no reason of any scenario in the game. And it only happens in a very specific series of resolutions that you only get if somebody's trying to resign and failing the resign test. 
And in that situation, as you're figuring out that anything else would have resulted in them living, them dying would have gotten them to live too. Then you find out like, oh, I could have just let the monsters kill me and I'd have lived because someone else resigns. The lack of polish, the rug pull killing of anyone trying to distract the aloof hunters, it feels so bad on a blind playthrough. And I can't in any good conscience rank this without saying that. Now, second playthrough, meta knowledge, you know that Act 3 makes all the aloof enemies stop being aloof. How does it rank? It's not bad. It's definitely better than all this stuff, but like, it's a super random scenario. Most of the enemies are aloof guys that don't do anything for most of the scenario and just action tax you. It's like a, just a really bad version of Pallid Mask. That's how I feel about it. I think the absolute bottom of five is where I want to put this. I would rather play Echoes of the Past or The Gathering for sure. I would really rather play The House Always Wins, A Phantom of Truth, or uh, All of the Nice. Like, it's nowhere near the top of fine. I almost want to still put it in bad even with meta knowledge, but I think that's just salt from our first playthrough being so bad. For the record, I'm the only person who lived. Everyone else in my party got permanently killed. I am the guy that didn't get fucked and I still feel this way. Which is particularly funny because I'm also the guy with Karen's Oval that dies way more easily than everyone else anyway, but I'm the only one who lived as Kaimani. And I only got out because Double Nimble just allows you to move across the whole map in one action. I think, oh man, I don't think this deserves to be in bad. Like it's a random scenario without any particularly interesting mechanics in it. The final boss is either a walkover or a 30 HP punching bag, depending on how many cards went hollow out. Neither of those are interesting. I legitimately just think it's barely fine. I don't think it's actually bad, but I have nothing good whatsoever to say about it. And that leaves us with Congress of the Keys, the finale. And this is an awkward one. We need to talk about why you play without a trace for a second. In Congress of the Keys, everyone who votes to kill you is going to show up as an enemy, unless you get set up three. Now, so that we're clear, people want to kill you. I don't know if there's even a way to play the campaign where no one votes to kill you. And what that means is that those guys are going to spawn as elite enemies engaged with the people who are not the lead investigator. And if there's more enemies than players, they'll just go into the deck too. So there's a really, really hard tempo pressure at the start of this scenario. Your fighter gets two actions to set up and then has to engage those enemies off of whoever drew them. They can also set up and try to fight. It's really rough. However, if you play without a trace, now it's just the people who remain eerily silent. Fun fact, neither Thorn or Desi will remain eerily silent unless you go there and get them killed. With Desi, that's a coin flip that you can avoid taking, whether it's by not going to Havana or by going to Moscow and getting the quid pro quo to find the real Desi. And with Thorn, just don't kill Thorn and he'll be the real Thorn. Like you have to actually go against Thorn and kill him or use his ally as Soak and get him killed for Thorn to be mimicked. So then, instead of spawning with multiple elite enemies engaged with you, you spawn with none. Oh, also, the entire coda rejoins you. Like, literally all of them. You start with seven story assets. It's crazy. And if they have keys, they bring those too. And I don't mean, like, buy a charisma. They don't take up ally slots. They're, they're really helpful. <laughs> they're very good. Without a trace turns the most likely point where you can lose the campaign into a walkover. But I think I rate Congress of the Keys on without a trace being played. Because even though the other scenario is harder and more interesting, you shouldn't be playing it. There is no team in the game that's like, yeah, we'll want to skip without a trace. We can just handle those elite enemies on turn one. That's not going to be a problem. Every team in the game is better at playing without a trace than having elite enemies on turn one. That's just universally true. So as a consequence, I'm rating it based on setup V3 with seven story assets and no silent enemies. And I think I put it right beneath Into the Maelstrom. It's now the new most underwhelming finale. You have like phase one in the Coterie hideout, and that's a walkover with setup B3. Then you go to the three part other world map. In the first location, you play without a trace light until you get uh, like players for clues, I think. Then you go to the second location and you just reveal decoys and waste time until the puzzle is randomly solved. You're just rolling dice until you get it right. And then after that, you go to the boss and then you're sort of doing the same thing with them, except you need keys to flip. So if you showed up with one key because you're playing it blind, good fucking luck. But like, yeah, it doesn't 
none of the pieces individually in that second half feel particularly good. Without a trace isn't good, and without a trace except there are no actor agendas involved and no interesting final locations, you just need eight clues and you're done, is especially not good. The time-wasting middle part's not good. The final boss is interesting and a good way to culminate the mechanics of a campaign into a boss, and the first part and its story ramifications are interesting, so even though like I don't like that it's a walkover, I like what it means for the campaign as a whole. Same thing's true of the very end. But all of that stuff in the middle, the bottom location, the knotted tower where you're just playing without a trace except none of the mechanics from without a trace are there, you're just doing the other world deck and nothing else, and the second location which is literally just random decoy reviewing until you're allowed to progress. What holds it together is so nothing to me. I, I can't do that. It's going under Phantom of Truth. I, I don't think it deserves to live that close into the Maelstrom. I think Heart of the Elders Part 2 is a very unique and interesting scenario, same with Essex County Express. I think Own Thin Ice is genuinely very fine. I think Phantom of Truth gets to live above it. Phantom of Truth's only problem is that every version I've ever played was a complete stomp to the point that I just didn't care. And I've never seen that not be the case, which is why it gets raked so low, even though it seems like it should be a much better scenario. I think Congress of the Keys gets to live down and fine over here. Going through all the scenarios we just ranked, Dealings in the Dark is one of my favorite scenarios, and Dancing Mad version 2 is absolutely fantastic, I really like that scenario. Marrakesh is not far behind Havana, I really like both versions of the scenario. I think Dogs of War Tower Defense is a very interesting and cool scenario, Riddles and Rain is a great introduction, Sanguine Shadows is a good blend of flavor and mechanics. But then we start getting into the ones that sort of hold the campaign down. The finales, I'm pretty lukewarm about that, and your first playthrough, there are so many polish issues that it's held down a lot more on your first playthrough. Without a Trace really doesn't have anything going for it that I care about, I can't think of anything nice to say about that scenario. And then Shades of Suffering is just... I don't want to talk about Shades of Suffering anymore. I'm not going to. I think I might have just skipped over On the Ice when I was quickly overviewing all the scenarios I just ranked which is wonderfully appropriate for how I feel about Thin Ice. It does seem like it would be easy to skip over. Anyways, that's it for me for now. I've been playing and recording Arkham for like two days straight now. I've did the entire Scarlet Keys campaign and a huge batch of reviews. So uh, I'm going to take a long break from recording, edit a big pile of stuff, and then we'll see what the future holds for us. I won't be playing anything until like two weeks real time from when I'm recording this. So there'll be a lot of time for me to think about what I should be playing next. Odds are very good that it's going to be Edge of the Earth, but I have no idea who I'll be playing in it. Anyways, I've been Rather Than Coherent. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the Scarlet Keys campaign. I hope you enjoyed the player reviews. I'm interested in hearing if you have any strongly different opinions about me on any of these scenarios, especially if they're positive opinions on Without a Trace or Shades of Suffering, because I would love to hear the counterpoint. I must like be missing something that someone else likes, right? Anyways, uh, like, comment, subscribe, blah, 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 YouTube algorithm control, you know why, helps the channel grow, blah, blah, blah. And I'll see you in the next one.